year to date in the stock market when we look at the S&P 500 we see a lot of companies performing very well up double digits but we also see other companies that have performed fairly poorly in today's episode we are going to look at five undervalued dividend kings that we believe are a buy now we also in today's episode are going to talk about an ETF for those that do prefer investing in ETFs rather than individual stocks we're going to take a look at the noble S&P 500 dividend aristocrat ETF towards the end of the episode so today we are looking as we said five undervalued dividend kings we're going to look at each company's historical performance we're going to discuss their dividend safety and as always we are going to run into their valuation model getting to the essential intrinsic value of each one their acceptable buy price we're going to look at the investor margin of safety and as always focus on what wall street see as upside over the next 12 month period so let's jump straight in and the first dividend king that we are discussing is S&P Global. Now just as a refresher, a dividend king is a company that has been increasing their dividend for the last 50 years and S&P Global is a new dividend king with 50 years of consecutive increases. Now when we take a look at the analyst, we see two buy ratings and one hold. Over the last 12 months, it has performed fairly strongly, up 22%. We do see a current pullback. It is in the mid point of the 52-week range. It does offer a forward yield at 0.88%, and we see a forward P of 29.45. Now, if this is one that you have been holding over the last 10 years, you would be up a fairly strong 463%, although do bear in mind, this doesn't include those dividends reinvested, so your performance as a long-term shareholder would be slightly higher as we saw the dividend safety is 99 this is very safe in fact the highest score obtainable we can see their market cap 130 billion they are a mega cap company now we also note that in fact they did have their dividend safety score reaffirmed not too long ago and as we can see their dividend safety are very safe meaning a dividend cut is extremely unlikely so when we take a look at those metrics from the last recession we note for S&P Global they in fact increased it during the last recession 0709 although they did have below average growth negative 38 percent for the same period the S&P was negative 12. Dividend growth now it was a massive shame that this year it only increased by 1.1 percent for two reasons it was a disappointment firstly we want a minimum of four percent on the channel it is what we advocate just to keep up in line with inflation but also over the last five years and the last 20 years we have come to love their double digit dividend growth which we didn't see this year However, as we stated, they are a fresh new dividend king with 50 years of consecutive increases. We then take a look at dividend yield theory. Now, for those that are new to the channel, it does state a company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five-year average. So we have a sign of reasonable valuation. In fact, when we also look at the forward P, it is pretty much a bang in line with the five-year average. Although, do bear in mind, we don't look at any of these models in isolation and we will conclude towards the end we then look at the sector p financials 11.4 therefore we can note that smp does have a fairly high forward p in relation to the sector when we take a look at the free cash flow power as always very important blanket rule below 60 percent to ensure that we can get those double digit dividend increases we love to see what we do note from smp is that it has been below 60 for the large part of the last 10 years and it does make it a bit disappointing when we note that last year was 32% and we only got a 1.1% increase. What we can note, FY24, it is expected to go even lower to 22%. So I would really like to see a nice double-digit dividend increase next January. When we look at the free cash flow, as always, incredibly important on this channel, we want to invest in companies with increasing free cash flows. Over the longer term, we can see nearly three times growth, a lot of inconsistency, although it is moving in the right direction. FY24 expected to go to all time highs in relation to that free cash flow per share. That is a positive sign. Sales growth, what we do when we do our deep dives, we analyze the income statement, their top line revenue. We do look for at least three to seven percent growth year on year. When we do a deep dive on S&P Global, we can in fact see their percentages are very strong, very healthy, double digits, the last full year coming in at 12%. And from this, we can see in fact that their top line has more than doubled over the last 10 years from 5.05 billion to 12.5. 
Now we do know with shares outstanding, we love to see companies that do those share buybacks, reducing the count year on year. Now we do know they did do that up to 2021. They did have an acquisition as we can see, which why the share outstandings has increased to 319. But over the last quarter, they did some share buybacks. As we can note, it has reduced by around 2 million. And we hope that the trend we have seen from 2014 to 2021 does continue. We then take a look at the ROIC. Again, these numbers will be slightly skewed from that acquisition, which we have covered in an earlier episode. Double digit is what we want to see on this ROIC metric, as this essentially gives us faith that management are able to effectively allocate their capital. We do know that it has dropped in 22-23. I would like to see 24-25. It starts to go back up to the numbers we have come to love with S&P Global. Now, operating margin, what we always want to see, operational efficiencies increasing over the longer term. We saw that up to 2021, it did drop into 2022, so I will be keeping my eye on, but this is one that I would like to see go back up into 2024 and beyond to the levels that we have seen not too long ago in the low to mid 50s. Free cash flow margin, no, no worries there whatsoever, above 5%, and that is pretty much what we see on a consistent basis. 29% in 2023, 31% on a trailing 12 months. So this is a very strong free cash flow machine, as we can clearly see. Finally, the net debt to EBITDA, the earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. Below three, with these numbers signaling to us the number of years it would take the company to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. And what we can note, it has been below three consistently, 1.81 last year, expected 1.62 in 2024, and in conjunction with that low free cash flow payout, the dividend does look and remains to be very safe, and the balance sheet also looks fairly healthy. Now let's jump into the valuation of S&P Global. As always, if you do enjoy the content, values being provided, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button, so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. And typically when we do our deeper dives, we do run through every single one of these models. Today's episode, let's jump straight into that final calculation. And the intrinsic value is the average of these two models coming in today's episode just shy of $500. So we have the current price somewhere away at 415 with a margin of safety. We always use 10% and we use that as a golden metric if it meets three criteria, a wide moat, strong financial metrics and good forward looking data. If you believe that with S&P Global, it looks to be a buy around $449. And then we keep going till it's near the current trading price. Now, today's episode, we don't quite see a 20% MOS level. We see between 15 to 20%. In terms of Wall Street and their indications, well, they see around 20% or just under in terms of upside with a price target of $493. As always, though, do let us know your thoughts in the comments below whether or not you are adding to any of these dividend kings. Also, just to let you know, we have released our latest free weekly article. If you want to gain access to this or any of our other articles, click on the pinned comment below. You will get instant and free access. And in fact, our one of our latest articles, we run through all the websites that we use on our channel, as that is a highly requested comment. Now, the next stock that we are looking at, another dividend king, looks undervalued. We have American States Water Company. Now, it is trading towards its 52-week low, and we will point out that when we look at the analyst, we do have one sell and two hold ratings. It does currently offer a yield of 2.46% and a forward P around 23, not too far off the average of the S&P 500. Over the last year, it hasn't had the greatest performance, down 22%. Over the last 10 years, however, we do note it has been up 131%, and it has been some time since we have seen the all-time highs of just over $100 at the back end of 2021. Now, dividend safety, 98, very safe score. Market cap, 2.6 billion. This is a mid-cap company. Now, when we take a look, we can, in fact, see their rating was reaffirmed not too long ago. So this isn't something that is outdated. It does look to be very safe. When we look at the key metrics from the last recession, well, they increased the dividend during the last recession. They had plus 2.2%, so above the average growth of the S&P. And they also significantly outperformed negative 30% recession return. Remember, the S&P 500 was negative 55. Very nice to note they have had, in fact, high single-digit dividend increases 8.2% last summer, 9% over the last five years, 7% over the last 20 years. This is something we quite like to see. And as we mentioned, not only are they a dividend king, they have been increasing those dividends for 69 years. 
Now, in terms of dividend yield theory, we do know a massive undervaluation signal, both on the yield as well as on the forward PE. However, when we do compare it, it is still significantly higher than the utility sector PE of 15.9. When we look at payout ratios, well, for utilities, it is a lot more volatile in terms of the free cash flow. So we do ignore it. We focus on the earnings and we want to see below 75% for this water utility. And we can clearly see it has been below that consistently. FY24 expected to be 57%. When we move on to the earnings per share, we also know that it has nearly doubled over the longer term. Although given this is a utilities company, have those realistic expectations when you are having your own investment thesis and analyzing. It isn't one that is going to grow massively year on year. As long as it consistently increases, that is a fairly positive sign. FY24, we are expecting an increase to 303. We then move on to the sales growth. We can, in fact, see the cyclicality nature of this industry. 2023, though, a massive year. It was up 21%. But likewise, when we do look at 2022, it was down 1%. And numerically, we can see whilst it has increased, again, remember, this isn't a tech company or a very, very large company that grows at massive rates. We do see from 466 million to 596 in terms of shares outstanding, quite interestingly, to be honest, with utilities, we do see the opposite. We see them dilute shareholders. This is one of the few that over the longer period, we do in fact see a net share buyback, although minimal, still quite positive to note. We then move on to the ROIC. For water utilities, we do lower it down to around 7.5 to 8%. And in fact, consistently, they've been above that 11% in the more recent year. So these are some positive signs from utility companies that you do want to note for any others that you do analyze. We also know some very strong operational efficiencies. The margin's gone from 26% in 2014 to 33%, and it has nearly improved every single year. So that is quite a nice thing to see. Net debt to EBITDA for water utilities, we bring it up to 5.5, whereas for majority, we look at three. Now it has increased over the longer term, 3.87 in 2023, FY24 at 4.14. So whilst it still is expected to increase, still below the 5.5, but again, something you may want to keep an eye on. However, when we look at that with essentially their payout ratio, it does look to be very safe and the balance sheet does look to be fairly healthy. Now, don't forget, you can grab a copy of the valuation model by clicking on the pinned comment below. So you can get to both the intrinsic value as well as the acceptable buy price of companies in your own portfolio. Now, a 10% margin of safety would take us to $74.26. At 15%, we pretty much see it isn't too far off the current trading price. At 20%, it isn't quite there yet. So for this company, we see around a 15 to 20% MOS level. How about Wall Street? Well, as we can see, they have a price target of just under $79. They see upside of 14% for this utility company. And as always, do let us know your thoughts and comments below. We then move on to the next undervalued dividend king, which is Lowe's company. Now with this, we have two buy ratings and one hold. It is currently trending in the midpoint of the 52 week range. And we do know a forward yield of 1.91% and a forward P much lower than the S&P of 18.86%. Now, over the last year, it is up around 14%. Over the last 10 years, however, if you have been a shareholder, you would be up nearly 400% without even including those dividends reinvested. In terms of dividend safety, well, we are on for three for three in terms of a very safe score at 93. Market cap, 132 billion, a mega cap company. And similar to the previous companies, they have had that very safe reaffirmed as well. So that is a positive sign. In terms of key metrics, well, in fact, they increased the dividend during the last recession. Whilst they did have above average growth, they did have a near S&P return at negative 52%. Dividend growth, again, very disappointing last year. Yes, it is above the inflationary increase, but over the last five years and the last 20 years with lows, we have been accustomed to those very high double digit dividend growths. As we mentioned, Dividend King with very nice 63 years of consecutive increases. Now, when we focus on dividend yield theory, we do get a sense of reasonable valuation, both on the yield and on the forward P, as they aren't too far off the rolling five-year average. But we also note the consumer discretionary sector P is lower at 14. So how about the payout ratio? Now, we can look at the free cash flow for this company below 60% and pretty much below that every single year, 35% next year expected as well. So there are no worries with this. And it is essentially understandable given that we did see that very safe dividend score at the beginning. 
Free cash flow, well, very mixed. It was fairly stagnant from 2015 to 2020. Then we saw that meteoric rise in 2021. And then ever since, it has been coming down. Although positive to note, we are expected to see all-time highs on the free cash flow in 2025. When we now analyze the sales growth, we did see a very poor year, down 11% on their top line. Before that, it was fairly mixed. Some years between that 3 to 7% we target. Some years a lot better, as we see in 2021. But also some years where, in fact, their top line didn't move much and we can see over the longer term 56 billion to 86. One of the things that Lowe's do very very well are those share buybacks as we can see consistently every single year so they are returning a lot of excess cash to shareholders not just through their double digit dividend increases but also through those share buybacks something that is very very strong and something to always include in your own investment thesis. ROIC, incredible. We're talking strong double digits over the last four years. We have 51% in 2023, 46% in 2024. It does make it very attractive to investors and potential investors as well. Operating margin, as always, whilst we want to see above 12%, we do note it was quite low for quite a significant number of years. But we can see overall operational efficiency. It is moving in the right direction. Last three years at 30% is still fairly healthy. And the same can be said for the free cash flow margin. It isn't too far off the minimums that we want to see. So maybe something to keep an eye on. But over the longer term, they have had some fairly strong and consistent numbers. When we then move on to the final net debt to EBITDA, something just to keep an eye on with their increasing debt levels that we can see. 2.92 expected over the next 12 months. So again, it for lows, if there was one metric or something that I would say as a red flag indicator would just be to ensure that over the next few quarters and the next year that this doesn't get out of hand as they are doing a lot of share buybacks. So let's move on to the valuation of lows. And as always, if you do enjoy the content, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. So margin of safety at 10%, we do see a buy up to $239. At 15%, we see it isn't too far off. So around a 10 to 15% MOS level for lows, although it is more towards the 15%. In terms of Wall Street and their expectation over the next 12 months, well, they do see this as a buy with a price target of $256, an upside of 12%. Now, I know there will be a lot of people in the community who do prefer Home Depot. So do let me know your thoughts as to whether or not you are adding lows or maybe waiting for Home Depot to come to a price that you do believe to be under valued the next dividend king that we have is swk stanley black and decker now over the last 12 months it is up 16 percent over the last 10 years however a very very big roller coaster up four percent we do see all-time highs nearly three years ago at 216 dollars right now though trading in the midpoint of the 52 week range with a yield of 3.61 percent and a forward p of 21.7 and we also note three hold ratings by the analysts so let's take a look. We have a dividend safety score of 80, market cap just under 14 billion. Now, when we take a look at those recessionary metrics, well, in fact, they increased the dividend. They had average growth and they also had a near S&P return. In terms of dividend growth itself, well, this seems to be a trend that we have noticed on today's episode. A fairly poor increase last summer, although over the last five years and the last 20 years, we are seeing increases of just above inflation. As we mentioned, they are not just a dividend king, but they have been paying a dividend for the last 147 years without a reduction. Now, in terms of looking at that dividend yield theory, we do see a massive undervaluation signal on the yield, 3.61 versus 2.04. Although we note the forward P isn't too far off the five-year average, but we do also note it is higher than industrials of 19.4. So quite importantly, free cash flow payout, what we can see, 2023, 57%. 2024 expected 70 percent so i wouldn't expect moving forwards for swk to have some very large dividend growth i would expect around that inflationary level so something just to consider for your own investment thesis free cash flow margin well very minimal movement over the longer term in fact it is expected to drop into fy24 at four dollars 65 and as we can see over the longer term there isn't much consistency with this company Sales growth, although I know a lot of people will argue there is cyclicality with this industry, we can see some years of good growth followed by years of negative growth and the trend continues year on year. The more recent year, negative 7% to their top line. And when we look over the longer term, it has essentially increased by around 40% from 11 billion to 15.8. Now, they have done both share buybacks as well as share issuances, diluting your position. Overall, it is essentially a share buyback of around 10 million shares. 
Now, when we move on to the ROIC, it has decreased. It isn't something we really want to note. Last two years in the single digit, so something we will factor into our margin of safety. We do want to see the numbers we have seen from 2014 to 2021. Now, both margins have decreased in the more recent period. We do note around the 12% was what we have seen up to 2021. Last two years, though, it has dropped. So this is something I would keep an eye on into 2024. In terms of the free cash flow margin, whilst it has dropped, 2023 is sitting around the minimum level we want. So not the worst case, but again, something just to take forward to analyze when you are looking at your own analysis. Net debt to EBITDA now it got very high in 2023. The positive to note is that it is expected to come sharply down to around four into 2024. But what we want to see is around the three level. So a few things just to keep an eye on. But as always, just because a company does have some metrics that are red flag indicators, it doesn't mean it isn't a buy. It can also be a very strong value play. So let's take a look. The intrinsic value in today's episode is $105. $89 as the current price, so a 10% MOS level, a buy up to $95 at 15%, pretty much bang on. So in today's episode, we see a 15% MOS level. In terms of Wall Street and their targets over the next 12 months, they have a price target of $107 with upside of 20%. Now, a lot of people will like this company. It is a dividend king. It has been paying a dividend for such a number of years, so it is incredible to see. But again, it does depend what your MOS level is and whether or not you are satisfied with Wall Street and their upside target of 20%. The next company that we are taking a look at is Abbott Laboratories. Now we have two buy ratings, one hold. It is trading in the midpoint of the 52 week range. It has a forward yield just over 2% and a forward P of just over 23. Over the last 12 months, pretty much flat down 1%. Over the last 10 years, though, it has been fairly strong, up 178%. And we do know all time highs, $140, but we are talking about over two years ago. Now, with dividend safety score of 90, majority of these dividend kings that we have analyzed today have very safe dividends. Market cap, 187 billion. It is a mega cap company. Now, last recession, well, in fact, they increased the dividend. They had positive recession sales, and they also had a very, very strong recession return. I'm sure if you're a regular viewer, you'll know how rare it is to be this good, negative 13% when the S&P came in at negative 55. And dividend growth also looks strong at 7.8%. Last December, 12% on average over the last five years. But we can see here over the longer term, keeping up in line with inflation at 4%. And we also note 52 years, so a dividend king, but also paying a dividend for the last 100 years without a reduction. Now, dividend yield theory, that double undervaluation signal is noted with the forward yield as well below the five-year average. But we do note that it is higher than the healthcare sector at 173 how about the free cash flow power? Well, below 60%, again, nearly every single year. 2023, it was higher, but the positive to take is 2024. It is expected to come down significantly to 38%. When we then analyze the free cash flow, we do see whilst it is inconsistent, it has grown over the longer term. 2024 is expected to be a very strong year in terms of that free cash flow, around 576 per share expected. In terms of sales growth, well, again, lots of inconsistencies. Some years, very poor. In fact, it has gone through a period where it was fairly poor, but then through a period from 2017 to 2021 where it was very strong. We do note the last two years have been very, very poor as well. Although numerically, we do see they have doubled their top line over the longer term. We also know they did dilute your position over the longer term as well. So again, factor that in, increasing from 1.53 billion to 1.75. We then look at the ROIC, very healthy, very strong, fairly consistent as well over the longer term. Last year, 13%, nothing to worry about there. We then look at the operating margin, again, operational efficiencies from 14% to 18%, and it is looking fairly healthy, only one year where it really does come down that 12% level, and the free cash flow margin consistently above 5%, 13% in the more recent year. We then finally move on to the net debt to EBITDA, very strong because it has been below three consistently and not only 0.82 in 2023, expected to be even lower in 2024. No worries with the dividend, no worries with that balance sheet strength. We then get into the valuation. Don't forget you can grab a copy of this model by clicking on the pinned comment below. You can then essentially get your own intrinsic value and acceptable buy price, whether it's companies in your own portfolio or those on your watch list, or even if you want to run through these ones again based on your own numbers. So a 10% margin of safety, we see a buy up to 117. 
15% up to 110 and at 20% it isn't quite there yet. So based on today's episode for Abbott Laboratories, the MOS level is sitting between 15 to 20%. When we take a look at Wall Street, well, their target 20% upside price target $129. So they do consider this to be a buy. And as always, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. As we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, for those that don't like to invest in companies, they like to invest in ETFs. Well, we have one suggestion, which is the Noble ETF, ticker symbol NOBL. It is essentially the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats. So it's not to get mixed up with dividend king. Dividend aristocrats are those that have increased, as we can see here, for at least 25 years. However, with this ETF, as we can see here, the majority of those held have in fact increased their dividends for 40 years or more. When we take a look at the performance we can in fact see that it has increased since inception by around 11.55 percent when we look over the last five years 10.75 percent and just over the last 12 months 13.5 so over the longer term, it has had some very nice growth. But again, let us know, maybe you do prefer an ETF. In fact, maybe you prefer just to buy stocks when you believe they are undervalued. Finally, just to let you know their holdings, as we can see, no massive weightings to any stock. Their largest one is Dover Corporation 1.75. And their top two and three, as we can see here, is Exxon Mobile coming in second at 1.7. But Target also has the same weighting. And if you want to take a look in the top five, they also hold Caterpillar and 3M. As always, though, do let us know your thoughts. Are you adding to any of these dividend kings which look to be undervalued? Are you waiting for their earnings to take place over the next few weeks? Or maybe for whatever reason, they aren't something that you like and you do prefer ETFs. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button. Let us know your thoughts below. And as always, we'll see you all on the next one.